Okay, this is our second webinar. The first one was last month. And I really wanna thank everybody for joining us and hopefully you will uh, enjoy it enough that you will join us in the future ones. Again, your feedback is essential and you need to let us know how we're doing and how we can do it better. This is, as we discussed the first time, it is the educational webinars with the purpose is to teach everyone and the mission that I came up with this last weekend as, we're, as I was putting these slides together is to make our community the most educated in the nation about atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> to be educated, that's not something you can do it in one hour or one webinar. That's why you will notice that we're gonna go relatively slow. We're gonna have a, a lot of focus on a lot of details about one aspect of atrial fibrillation at a time. And uh, I'll try to make it relevant, relevant to each one of you as we're doing these webinars. And again, if anything you need to change, please let us know. Last time I promised you we're gonna have an email that you'll be able to communicate with us. We got the email, but the email was not an easy to remember. So we're not gonna give it to you tonight. We'll do it by next webinar next month. And going forward, instead of having to call to register, you can just email us to register. One other thing we'll try to do is to give the same ID for the Zoom to connect every time. So if you ever join us, you can just join us anytime without having to check in or to register to make it an easy process. Last time we did this, let me just hide this. Last time we talked about, I'm trying to hide. Do you see the panel on the top of my screen? Again, during last webinar, I'm just gonna put the highlights of the last webinar. During last webinar, I just uh, shared with you the multidisciplinary team we have taking care of atrial fibrillation patients. Uh, you can see my partners here, Dr. Lundquist, the cardiovascular surgeon, and our physician assistants and nurse practitioners and coordinators for atrial fibrillation center. We learned that atrial fibrillation is an electrical problem of the heart that results in the change in the rhythm and the heart beating in a way that's irregular. If the top chambers of the heart here, the bottom chambers here, on the left side, you see the heart pump beating in the case of normal sinus rhythm. On the right side of the screen, you see the heart beating when it is in atrial fibrillation. The top chambers of the heart we call the atria, the bottom chambers ventricles, so atrial fibrillation is a problem in the top chambers of the heart, not in the bottom. And when the top chambers are going very fast, that can drive the heart in a way that's irregular. The main concern of patients with atrial fibrillation is when the top chambers are beating very fast and the blood is not moving very well, you could have a blood clot that can break off and go from the top chambers to the bottom chambers and then pumped out of the left bottom chamber to the big artery, the aorta, and that can go to the brain and deprive part of the brain from getting the blood supply, the oxygen, and the nutrition it needs and cause what we call stroke. So this is the main concern. And to mitigate that concern, we also talked and addressed using anticoagulation and we talked about patients at risk with atrial fibrillation for uh, needing anticoagulation. We talked about warfarin and we talked the new blood thinners, the Predexa, the Zeralto, Aliquis and Cerveza and how they are a little bit more convenient than warfarin. And we spoke about patients who cannot take the medications due to the risk of bleedings. We have the options of giving them Watchman device or clipping of that part of the top chamber of the heart that can cause the clot to form. So either you can take the pills to reduce the risk of stroke or we can plug 
that pouch or the part of the top chamber of the heart where the clots are usually formed, or we can clip that portion. And this is uh, the slide that was a favorite of uh, one of you. Uh, this is just when everything is in sync, that's what you call sinus on the left. When everything is out of sync, that's when you call atrial fibrillation. And this is another one out of sync. So we agreed on having sinus rhythm as better than having atrial fibrillation. So this is a summary of the last uh, webinar from last month. Today's objectives, basically to learn different aspects regarding antiarrhythmics. Antiarrhythmics are medications we use to keep the patient in normal rhythm. So what we're gonna learn is the names of the most commonly used antiarrhythmic medications, how effective are they, how safe are they, what side effects, common side effects they may have, and what bad side effects or what we call toxicities. If by the end of this webinar, you are familiar with the names and with the major side effects and precautions, I think you will feel very good. And when you see your doctor next time, if you or somebody you know has atrial fibrillation, you will be more familiar with the process and what your doctor may prescribe for you. When we treat patients with atrial fibrillation, the main goals of the therapy are Number one, and the most important, is to prevent the stroke. How? By giving blood thinners, and we talked about that, the pills, or those who cannot take the pills because of bleeding risk, we can provide them with the option of watchman device or clipping of the part of the top chamber where the clots are usually formed, and we do that surgically to reduce the risk of stroke in a way similar as if the patient is on blood thinners, provide the protection without having the need to be on a blood thinner for the rest of your life if you have atrial fibrillation. The other goal is to improve the symptoms of patients with atrial fibrillation. As we discussed in atrial fibrillation, the top chambers are going very fast. They drive the bottom chamber very fast and that can give the sense of fluttering sensation in the chest and palpitations, shortness of breath. So we give medication to slow the heart rate down. That's what we call rate control. We control the rate of the heart. We also improve symptoms if we get the heart back in rhythm by restoring the normal rhythm, bring back the normal sinus rhythm. And that's what we call rhythm control. And that will be the focus of our webinar today. Of course, another purpose or goal is to prevent the heart from getting too weak by being so fast for so long, by keeping it in rhythm, and if we're not keeping it in rhythm, by keeping it under control without going too fast. Before going further discussing antiarrhythmics, I would like to teach you about what we call classifications of atrial fibrillation. And it is important. So we call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, basically atrial fibrillation episodes that happen by themselves, they come and go by themselves, and they usually last than, less than one week. We call it persistent when atrial fibrillation comes on and doesn't go away unless you see a doctor that will perform, for example, cardioversion to get you out of it. We call it long-standing persistent when atrial fibrillation has been there for more than one year. We call it permanent when atrial fibrillation is there to stay, and you as a patient and the physician gave up trying to get back in rhythm. And it is important because sometimes patients say, well, I was in atrial fibrillation last week. I'm not in it this week. Do I need to be on a blood thinner? Yes, you do. Having atrial fibrillation, it doesn't matter if it is paroxysmal, meaning if it comes and go on its, uh, by itself, or if it's persistent, and whether you had a cardioversion for it or not, and whether it's been persistent for a month or for more than a year, or it's been there all the time, regardless how often you have atrial fibrillation or how long those episodes last, the indication for anticoagulation is there. And don't rely on the fact you had atrial fibrillation last week when you were in the hospital, but not this week to stop the blood thinner. The risk of stroke by having atrial fibrillation, regardless of what kind or what type is similar and the need for a blood thinner is the same. 
So this is just to show you the different types of atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal, assuming the blue is the normal sinus rhythm, the red is when atrial fibrillation episodes occur. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the episodes occur by themselves and they terminate themselves and they usually last than, less than one week. Persistent atrial fibrillation, the episode lasts longer than a week and they usually don't stop by themselves unless you do what we call cardioversion, which is basically shocking the heart back in rhythm. Permanent atrial fibrillation is when atrial fibrillation in red is the rhythm all the time. No time when the heart goes back to sinus. So you'll be in sinus rhythm, you develop atrial fibrillation, go back to sinus rhythm, fibrillation, go back to sinus rhythm, fibrillation, go back to sinus rhythm, and so forth. All these episodes are self-limiting and they don't last more than one week. That's what we call paroxysmal. Persistent, unless you do something about it, it does not go back in sinus rhythm. How many of you, with the raise of hands, with a show of hands, how many of you know somebody who had cardioversion for atrial fibrillation? And that somebody could be you. Just wave your hand, and that'd be a good practice for you to know that we're getting really proficient with this Zoom features. Patrick will tell us the number. And for those who didn't have the chance to speak to Patrick, Patrick has been in the charge of uh, registering every one of you guys and setting everything. And, and without him, this would not be possible. So I want to take this opportunity to thank him again. So anyone responded? Okay, well, at least one of you is familiar with cardioversion. So cardioversion is the process by which we get rhythm from atrial fibrillation back to sinus rhythm. If you look at this slide, you're probably all familiar with this concept of having patches placed on the top part of the heart, on the torso, on the chest. And the reason we put those patches in this position, as you see in the bottom part of this slide, so the heart is in the middle or in the field of the electrical current or the electrical power that's delivered between these two patches. You want the electricity to be delivered and go through the heart to reset the heart back in rhythm. People ask me, are you gonna stop my heart? We don't stop the heart by the cardioversion. We stop the bad rhythm, atrial fibrillation and other bad rhythm and allow your normal rhythm to take over again. <clears throat> How we do it, this is the animation, so you don't feel bad for this guy. This is basically the heart is going irregular and the shock is delivered. The procedure is done for those who had it or know somebody who had it, is done under sedation. So you're not gonna feel the pain. You're not gonna remember anything. It takes about five to 10 minutes for the whole procedure. Anesthesia will put you to sleep, like twilight zone, just like if you've ever had a colonoscopy or upper endoscopy, uh, similar kind of sedation and we put the patches on the body. And then once the patient is asleep, we click on one button and the shock is delivered and the rhythm is restored back to normal. Sometimes the shock doesn't work. Sometimes you need more than one shock. Nonetheless, that's what cardioversion or electrical cardioversion is. This is supposed to be a joke. So if you're laughing, it's okay if I can't hear you. This is how they did the cardioversion in the old days. This is smaller shock, bigger shock. They did not have the advantage of being sedated. So luckily we have sedation and we have a more, uh, a nicer way of doing cardioversions. Now we learned last webinar what atrial fibrillation is. Each one of these spikes is a heartbeat. And you can see those heartbeats are fast compared to the right side of this slide. On the right side, you have evenly spaced heartbeats. That's what we call regular normal heart rhythm. On the left, faster, irregular. If you look at the spacing between beats, it's a little bit not equal. When we deliver the shock, this is exactly what happens. You go from atrial fibrillation really fast to normal. 
We don't stop your heart. We're not risking much. You just get rid of the bad rhythm and back to normal sinus rhythm. Is it a good idea to wait before cardioversion? And is there is any advantage to doing cardioversion sooner rather than later? Yes, there is. If you have atrial fibrillation, and if the plan to get you back in rhythm, the sooner we do it, the higher the chance we'll be able to successfully get you back in rhythm. In this study, on the x-axis, you can see the duration of atrial fibrillation, less than two days, up to a month, one to six months, six months to a year, more than a year. The longer you wait, the lower the chance that cardioversion will be successful getting you back in rhythm. If we do it within two days, 95% plus chance will get you back in rhythm. If we wait more than a year, probably two out of three patients will be able to get them back in rhythm. Is a day or two or three make a big difference? Not really. Look here, you're still in the 90s chance of getting back in rhythm within the first month. But the point is, don't wait six months, don't wait a year. And if your doctor said, we need to get you back in rhythm next week, the week after, now you understand the basis for it. Once your heart is in atrial fibrillation and gets used to atrial fibrillation, it's gonna be hard to convince those circuits to disappear and allow the normal rhythm to take over. One concept I would like to highlight, and it's really important you all understand it very well. And again, you probably notice in these webinars, I'm going slow and make sure every concept is understood so well, hopefully, if you ever need any of these procedures, if you ever have atrial fibrillation or need to understand any aspect of it, you feel like you already have briefing and good review of the topic. So the concept I would like to explain and make sure you understand is the difference between what we call the echocardiogram and what we call TEE. Both are echocardiograms. <clears throat> One we call transthoracic echocardiogram. When your doctor say, okay, let's get an echo, we usually mean this kind. Echocardiogram, we send the ultrasound beams across the chest wall. That's why we call it transthoracic, across the chest wall echocardiogram. If you ever heard of TEE, which is transesophageal echo, that means we put the probe, the ultrasound probe, through the mouth, through the throat, to the esophagus, which is the tube that connects your throat with the stomach. And the purpose of this is to be close distance to the heart so we can see the structures better. Any of you had an echo or a TEE? Again, wave your hand if you do or you did. <clears throat> Patrick says, there's a bunch. Okay, well, good. Any of you knows of a TEE or had a TEE or anybody else you know had a TEE? Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, it looks like you're familiar with both. Hopefully, in a few minutes, you will understand why you had one and not the other. So, for the transthoracic echocardiogram, you see the hand holding the probe. This is the chest wall. The ultrasound waves are going through the chest wall in the middle here, slicing through the heart and giving us the picture on the right. And this is a live picture. And you can appreciate something is squeezing. That's the bottom chamber of the heart. We call that trans, trans thoracic echocardiogram. You don't need to be sedated for this. You don't need to have an IV line for this. You don't need anesthesia. Could be done in the hospital, at the bedside, in the office, in the clinic, anywhere. It's, it's very simple. It's a non-invasive test. And this is again, just to show you that transthoracic echocardiogram is basically you're slicing through the heart. You see all the chambers of the heart and you display those chambers in black and white. Of course, we can add colors to that. And depending how you're slicing the heart and the plane you're slicing the heart, 
it basically you get the picture depending on what slice you're using. And in order to be able to see all the chambers, you change the angle of the probe, the way you slice the heart and how you do it. Transesophageal echocardiogram or what we call TEE, as I told you, the probe is not on the chest. The probe goes through the mouth, to the throat, to the esophagus. And this is a representation of it. It goes down, we pull it up and down. You can see we change how we slice with the ultrasound waves across or through the heart chambers and vessels. So we can see any chamber or any structure we would like to see. The advantage of TEE, again, transesophageal or TEE versus transthoracic, you can see the distance is very close for the TEE. It allows us to see more structures in a better, more clear way. And that's why we would use TEE versus regular echo. This is another representation of the TEE. You go down the throat, down the esophagus, and on the left, you can see the images we're seeing as we're changing the angle of that probe. And this is the top chamber here. And when we change the angle a little bit, we cut the heart in a different angle, we can probably see that pouch we talked about to look for the possibility of a clot. Again, I'm gonna drill that concept home here more and hopefully you'll never have to wonder why you're getting regular echo versus TEE. This is the heart here in the middle. The top part of this picture, this is the bone, these are the muscles, this is the skin. This is basically the chest wall. This is the front of the chest. We sliced through the chest like when you do a CT scan. In the back, you have the spine here or the vertebral column. Between the front of the chest and the back, you have the heart. If we do regular echo, the ultrasound waves are going through the skin, the fat under the skin, the muscle under the fat, the bone, the lining of the lungs to the heart. And if my point of interest, the back of the heart where the top chambers are, remember the clots are formed in the top chambers. So before we do cardioversion, we need to make sure there is no clots. To make sure of that, we do ultrasound. This is too much to travel before we get to the point of interest if we are looking for a clot in this target area. Versus if we have our TEE probe, remember in the esophagus, the esophagus, which is the tube that connects your throat with the stomach, lies behind the heart in the back and the spine behind that. Look at the distance you have to travel. The ultrasound waves don't have to travel much at all, a centimeter or two to get to this chamber. Which one would be better to look at this chamber? It's easy, the one that's closest. In order to be able to listen to somebody whispering, you better be very close to them, not outside the room, like the case of the regular echo. So this again, to explain over and over, the difference between regular echo and TEE. TEE is used to provide us with better imaging of the top chambers and let us know if there is a clot or not. That's from a nature fibrillation standpoint, but also to see the valve, to see different points of interest, we may use TEE. Another difference, of course, to put the probe down the throat to the stomach, just like you're having upper endoscopy. You're going to your stomach doctor, you have an ulcer, you have a reflux, they do that. So you need sedation, you have to probe put down, you need an IV line for sedation, you need to be monitored. It may take, the whole ordeal may take a few hours to allow you to get to, sedate, to be sedated, to wake up, to recover. You need somebody to drive you in and drive you out of the hospital. You don't need any of that with regular echo. So hopefully that's enough to tell you the difference between the regular echo and the TEE. Patrick here uh, nodding, saying he got it. So I hope you did too. One last image to show you the difference. A TEE looking at the top chambers of the heart, 
things are in focus on the left. Looking through all the layers of the chest wall, the lungs, other parts of the heart before we get to the top chamber, out of focus, just like the one on the right. Now, let's get to the antiarrhythmics, meaning medications we use to help you get back in rhythm. The concept is, it would be best if we get people back in rhythm, restore the normal rhythm or what we call sinus rhythm. To do that, if you are in atrial fibrillation, persistent that is, we need to do cardioversion. We can get you back in rhythm either by the shock I just showed you a few slides back or by giving you medicine to get you back in rhythm. The shock is more effective getting you back in rhythm than the medicine getting you back in rhythm. But remember, the shock only gets you back in rhythm, does not keep you in rhythm. If we don't give you medication strong enough to keep you in rhythm, the chance of you staying in rhythm a year later after the shock is only 20 to 30%. And you need also to remember that before we shock people in rhythm, we wanna make sure there's no clot in the top chamber. Can you imagine the top chambers quivering and you have a clot, and then we get you back in rhythm, and all of a sudden the top chambers beating vigorously, normally, moving the blood. You don't want a clot there when you get the rhythm back to normal, and that clot is pumped from the top to the bottom chamber and up to the brain and cause a big stroke. So we need to make sure there is a blood thinner on board for at least three weeks before or get a TEE to make sure there is no clot. And after we get you back in rhythm, we need to make sure you're on a blood thinner for at least four weeks after. Because although the top chambers get back in rhythm, it is weak. It is not as strong. It may take up to four weeks to get to its normal strong squeeze and move the blood again like it used to before. Also, don't stop the blood thinner at least four weeks. Of course, we'll talk more about other conditions, but this is just an idea about what do we mean by rhythm control and how to get you back in rhythm by cardioversion. Once again, cardioversion by definition is getting atrial fibrillation to be terminated and converted to normal rhythm, what we call SR or sinus rhythm. Cardioversion converts atrial fibrillation to normal rhythm, but does not maintain normal rhythm. It gets you on rhythm, does not keep you on rhythm. So how do we maintain the normal rhythm we love to stay in? One of two ways, either by medications, meaning medications that control the rhythm and prevent the bad rhythm, and that's what we call antiarrhythmics, or catheter or surgical ablation, which would be the topic of next webinar and the thing that we do every day. I've done three of them today, but again, the purpose of these webinars is not to advertise for one approach versus the other, is to make you the most educated about everything related to atrial fibrillation. And I, you know, that is a very ambitious goal of mine, and uh, I believe it's doable, and I believe for a community like ours, it doesn't take much if we spread the knowledge for people to know about it. And just think about it. Atrial fibrillation is one of the main causes for strokes. If you are educated about atrial fibrillation and understand the benefit of blood thinner use if you have atrial fibrillation, and if we start that early, imagine how many strokes we can stop from happening. If you understand what atrial fibrillation is, and you know that there is treatment for it, your quality of life can improve significantly. And some of you may already have Apple Watch or got some Christmas gifts as Apple Watch. Any of you? Show of hands. <laughs> no? Well, we may, we may have uh, those as a gift uh, for webinars. How many? Okay, a few of you already have uh, Apple Watches as gift or already have them. Well, Apple Watches, like many other tools we have now,
can tell you or suggest to you if you're likely to be in atrial fibrillation or not. So now, if that watch tells you you're in atrial fibrillation, you need to be uh, acting on it. You understand why, and you understand the risk of stroke. And if you're feeling bad, you can check your pulse. And remember, the symptoms of atrial fibrillation, not always heart fluttering sensation. Could be just shortness of breath, could be tired, could be chest pain, could be dizziness. Remember all that? Or could be nothing. Could be your watch telling you, hey, you have atrial fibrillation. And you say, no, I don't believe you. Well, before you say that, check it out. Check with your doctor. Again, the main topic is antiarrhythmics today. So let's <clears throat> dive in. Antiarrhythmics are medications that keep you in rhythm. A few things you need to know, and you can call them facts. No matter how effective those medications are, they will eventually fail to maintain sinus rhythm. All of them have side effects and toxicities. Although we are using them to control atrial fibrillation and get you back in rhythm, unfortunately, some may cause worse rhythm than atrial fibrillation and potentially life-threatening in certain situations. They have a lot of possible interactions with other medications. And some of them, as we will learn, will require to be started in the hospital and require hospitalization for up to three days. What are the common antiarrhythmics? <clears throat> we have classes. I don't want you to memorize class one or class three, but you know, if you're gonna be the most educated in the nation, you better take it seriously. Class one has these two common medications, Rhythmol and Flecainide. Any of you heard of these two medications? Propafenone, Tambacor, Flecainide, Rhythmol, any of you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Class three include Betapace or Sotolol. You know, this is between the generic and the brand name. Tycosin is the brand name, generic Dufitilide, and Mudarone is the generic name. They come in Pacerone. Multac on Dronidrone. Any of you heard of any of these medications? <clears throat> I'm waiting on Patrick to tell me how many. Almost all. Beautiful. Well, almost all of you will get something out of this. <clears throat> so let's learn more about it. This is atrial fibrillation. You do something about it, it goes back in rhythm. Atrial fibrillation, remember? Top chambers, we call atria. When the rhythm is all over the place, it's called atrial fibrillation. And this is the sinus rhythm. What do we do to get the heart from atrial fibrillation to sinus? Cardioversion. And the electrical cardioversion is the most effective. After we get you back in rhythm, we really need to give you medication to keep you in rhythm. I gave you names. Some of you are familiar with it. So let's talk about them. How effective are they? How safe are they? And their side effects and toxicities. And hopefully that will cover everything we need to learn today. So regarding effectiveness, this is one of the trials that used placebo, sotolol, or amiodarone in patients with atrial fibrillation. And they followed them up to three years and they looked at the percentage of patients who remained in sinus rhythm. Placebo, the lowest percentage. Sotolol was way more effective than placebo, keeping people in rhythm, and the amidrone was the most effective. Another study looked at amidrone and sotolol. You know, in this study, amidrone looked much better than sotolol. Other study, if you have blocked arteries, actually amidrone and sotolol were almost as effective. And both are way more effective than nothing or placebo. So we know those medications work very well, keeping people in rhythm and way better than placebo. Let's look, comparing the different rhythm medications regarding their effectiveness. In this study, again, followed the patient about two years Amidrone remains on top, the best at keeping people in rhythm. 
propafenone and sotolol. Propafenone, also the other name for it is rhizmol. Sotolol, the other name for it, beta pace. Amidrone, propafenone and sotolol, almost similar. But regardless how you look at all these graphs, the one point I wanna mention, number one, any of them is good and better than placebo. Number two, no matter how good they are, within two years, look at that. Amidrone, the best is about 60, 70%. Sotolol propafenone within two years, only 50% stay in rhythm. That's why, why I said, eventually, each one of those medications will fail keeping people in rhythm. And why I'm saying all that? Because that would be why we would move to the next step, which is catheter ablation, or why would we consider catheter ablation even before trying a medicine knowing it will eventually fail. <clears throat> Nonetheless, it is an option. How safe are these medications? Well, we have studies. In 1989, flaconide, again, rhythmol and flaconide, the same class, was used to treat rhythm problem in people after they had a heart attack. And the idea was, if we suppress those bad rhythm, the patients should do better and do well. Unfortunately, those who receive flaconide after a heart attack, those who receive flaconide, the red, did not live as long as those who did not receive flaconide. And that study in 89 was the basis behind don't use flaconide, don't use Rhythmol, don't use class one rhythm medications in people who had heart attacks. So for those of you who know somebody with atrial fibrillation and had blocked arteries or had heart attacks, now you know why you're not prescribed flaconide or rhythmol while your nephew or neighbor did. <clears throat> so for class one antiarrhythmics, which include rhythmol or propafenone, flaconide or tambacor, these are just different names. We use them when there is no significant structural heart disease, meaning the heart as a structure is normal. No prior history of heart attack and no blocked arteries, no heart failure, simply healthy hearts. That's why we use those medications in young people, 40s, 50s, 60s, even early 70s, as long as the heart is okay. The echo of the heart shows the heart is in good shape, no history of heart attack, no weak heart, no blocked arteries. Class one antiarrhythmics, healthy heart, you get that. Now class three antiarrhythmics. Actually studies have shown, unlike class one, that they are safe if you use it in people with ischemic heart disease. Ischemic heart disease meaning heart that are weak because of previous heart attacks. Hearts that had prior heart attacks. Remember the class one, when they are used in people with prior heart attacks, they were not good. If you use a neuterone, which is class three, in people with prior heart attacks or weak hearts, the mortality or people survived just as well as if they were on placebo. So not more people died from a neuterone. The same thing for ticosin and dofetilide, meaning class three, if you use them in people with weak hearts, with bad hearts, with sick hearts, in hearts with prior heart attacks, they are safe. So thank God now we have class one that are safe in healthy heart, and we have class three in case your heart is not healthy. Now you understand, when you have atrial fibrillation, the doctor may say, I need to do an echo. And you say, why are you gonna do an echo? I'm fine. I'm running five whatever uh, miles a day. I'm walking this distance. Well, we need to know, not based on your symptoms, we need to know based on the echocardiogram, the images of the heart, that the structure is normal, not too thick, not too weak. Nothing suggests problems. 
we may need to do a stress test. Why? To check if there is any suggestion of blocked arteries or suggestions of prior heart attack. So that's why we would do an echocardiogram and cardiac stress testing before we decide on what kind of rhythm medication we would be safely putting you on. So this is the slide that summarizes what I talked about and will be used for the next webinar to highlight this webinar's major points. Antiarrhythmics, medications that help you stay in rhythm in case you have atrial fibrillation, your doctor asks simple question. Is this heart healthy? Good echo, good stress test, yeah? Feel free to start class one, Rhythmol or Flecainide. The heart is not healthy, I don't want to call it sick, but not healthy <clears throat> because it's weak, because it's too thick, because previous heart attack, then we need to, you need to use class three. And that's when you use Sotolol, Bufitilide, or Amiodarol. So this is the summary for what we talked about so far. Side effects. I'm going to just highlight the things that are common. If you open the pocket insert of any of these medications, you will see so many things, everything you can imagine. And the, the, the funny thing is you find everything you can imagine in the placebo as well. So for the class one, for the Rhythmol, the one thing you, you need to remember in case it happens with you or somebody you know using it, you have a change in taste. It may feel bitter or metallic taste and shortness of breath is possible. Flecainide also shortness of breath or chest tightness. Any symptom you have after taking any medicine that could be a side effect, so be aware. But change in taste, well, you know, thank God it's not the loss of taste like COVID. <clears throat> it's a change in taste, not the loss of taste. Class three, this is what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about their side effects. Class three, Sotolol, Ticacin, and Neuderol. These three drugs, you will hear them over and over, and some of you already heard about them. Sotolol and Dufitilide or Ticacin can cause what we call torsad or life-threatening arrhythmia. All you need to know that those medications can potentially be life-threatening. And you say, really? You're treating atrial fibrillation? That's not immediately life-threatening with a medicine that could cause life-threatening rhythm? Yes. As long as we're using it according to directions and according to the right precautions and take the necessary steps, they are safe. You can, you can have a life-threatening condition from taking aspirin if you don't know how to use it, from taking too much Motrin, from taking too much blood thinner. So any medicine, if not used properly, could be life-threatening. But for these two medications, they could be life-threatening by causing bad rhythm. Amiodarone, most common side effects, GI, nausea and vomiting. Other side effects, neurologic. You can have tremor, you can have unsteady gait. The toxicities, which we watch very carefully, is involving usually the lung, the liver, or the thyroid gland. This is the torsade I'm talking about. Now you're experts reading EKGs. The left part of this strip, the first three spikes or squiggles, that's what I call heartbeats. Look at this part here. Assuming this heartbeat is 100, how fast do you think this, these heartbeats? Three, 400 beats a minute. People don't live with this. Luckily, we monitor people when we give them these medications in the hospital. And should this develop, we are there to deliver the shock and save the patient's life. But we have way earlier warning signs before this happens that will allow us to adjust the dose or stop the medicine. Another thing you need to know, and these things you will be hearing about if you ever get started on them from your doctor, from the nurse, from the cardiovascular educator in the hospital, from everybody who would see you while getting started on these medications. Because of the risk of causing potentially life-threatening rhythm, dofetilide or ticacin, sotolol, the other name for it is betapase, need to be started in the hospital. 
Why? So we can monitor your rhythm very closely. You need to be in the hospital for three days because that's how long it takes to load your body with this medicine, to get to the level that will be maintained after you leave the hospital. And as we are ramping up the level and increasing the level in your body, we wanna make sure you're tolerating it. They are filtered by the kidneys. So we need to make sure your kidney function is close to normal. If it's not close to normal, if it's a little bit abnormal, we have to cut down on the dose. If they are really bad, you just can't take them. And we need to monitor your rhythm and your tolerance to these medications by EKGs. And don't forget, these medications can interact with a lot of other medications, some of which are very common. Common antibiotics, common over-the-counter, common antidepressants. A lot of medications can interact with them. So what do we say to our patients? Every time I see my patient who takes Sotolol or Dofetilide, I tell them, before you take any new medication, you tell your doctor that you are on Sotolol. You tell your doctor you are on Dofetilide so they can check for side effects and possible interaction. Sometimes you call your doctor over the weekend for a cough or bronchitis or pneumonia or whatever, or, or UTI, urine infection, and your doctor gives you the medicine over the phone. The doctor may not look at the list of your medications, just remind them. And if you have any question, ask the pharmacist. If you are to buy over-the-counter medications, ask the pharmacist, check Google, call your office doctor, call us. We'll answer that question. But it is so important, it could be a life or death situation. I'm not trying to scare you here, but just to be very careful. And actually, with that much care, we take and we educate our patients regarding these two drugs. Our patients do very well, and we use these drugs routinely every week. This is, again, to highlight how seriously we take starting the patient with atrial fibrillation on Sotolol or Dofetilide. We'll bring them to the hospital and we tell them to bring a book or something to read or a computer because it'll be boring three days. The first day, all you do, you get two doses, one in the morning, one in the evening. Day two, same thing, two doses. Day three, two doses. And we, go an e we get an EKG three to four hours after every dose to watch for any warning that your heart may not be tolerating this medicine. And while in the hospital, we'll have your heart monitored continuously. Every heartbeat is monitored by those in the room in the central monitoring. That's how serious we take it. And that's what you need to know about it. The amiodarone has its own toxicities. You probably remember from previous slides, it's the best, meaning the most effective, keeping people in rhythm compared to other rhythm medications. And fortunately, it has also the worst side effects. It can affect the thyroid gland in the neck here. The thyroid is the gland that's responsible for our metabolism. If it's overactive, we feel hot, we lose weight, we use a lot of energy. It's like the gas pedal in the car. If the thyroid is underactive, we are sluggish, we are slow, like the brake. So amiodarone can cause that thyroid gland either to be overactive or underactive. Which one it causes, we don't know. We just keep an eye on it and check the blood test every six months, every 12 months, or depending on the symptoms. It can affect the liver and also it can affect the lungs. Because of these serious toxicities, we watch the blood test to check for the thyroid regularly. We check the blood test to check the liver function test regularly. We check the chest x-ray and what we call pulmonary function test, meaning you blow in a tube, we measure the volumes of your lungs, we measure the ability of your lungs to pass the oxygen and the CO2 or carbon dioxide on both directions. And if we see any signs of any of these being affected, what do we do? We stop the medicine. 
and more than 90% of the time, things go back to normal. Nonetheless, these are possible side effects. This is not my patient, so I'm not breaking any HIPAA here. This is from the internet, actually. But I had a patient exactly like that. What we call photosensitivity or blue man syndrome that happens with amiodarone. The deposits from the amiodarone in the skin cause this bluish discoloration. Within a year after you stop the amiodarone, the color comes back to normal. This guy was smiling both ways. He must be happy to be in rhythm. So let's summarize. You have atrial fibrillation and you would like to stay in rhythm after cardioversion. And you would like to give the medicine a try before considering catheter ablation. If your heart is healthy, now you know why your doctor going with what we call a class one, Rhythmol and Flecainide. If your heart is sick, meaning weak or too thick, the muscle is too thick, or had prior heart attack, you go with class three, amiodarone, sotolol, dofetilide. If the kidneys are not good, the only option left for you is amiodarone. If your lungs are not good, you know amiodarone can cause problems. Then you're really out of options or good options. So that's why now you understand hopefully why our options sometimes are limited and why do we choose which medicine to treat atrial fibrillation and why we may end up with catheter ablation as a second choice or as a first choice. Now, in preparation for the next webinar, which we'll be talking about catheter ablation, my favorite topic, I wanna just put this slide on to show you that one study showed that ablation has a much better chance keeping people in rhythm compared to rhythm medications. Although this webinar, we learned that rhythm medications much better than placebo, which was down here. Placebo, very bad. Rhythm medications, better. Catheter ablation, the best so far. With that, I think we're finishing this webinar and I'll be happy to entertain any questions.